If you're not doing the basic stuff, the foundational work, there's no way you can possibly work with the more advanced stuff either. Maybe modeling architectures after uh, massive behemoths is probably not the best way to do things. It's hideously expensive to run this stuff yourself, and you're probably not an expert at it. I think that serverless is where Docker was a few years ago, in that it's really cool and uh, works in my machine is about the extent of it. It's great for prototyping, but then once you try to run an actual infrastructure on it, there's a lot of questions that we haven't solved yet. Welcome to High Leverage, a series of conversations about scaling modern software teams through better tooling and processes. I'm your host, Joe Ruscio, a general partner here at Heavybit. High Leverage is brought to you by Heavybit, a program that helps companies building cloud infrastructure, developer tools, and APIs take their products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you'd like to suggest a guest or topic for this show, let us know on Twitter, at Heavybit. All right, welcome back to the uh, podcast. Super excited to be joined today by uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Julian. If you don't know, he's a O'Reilly author. Practical Monitoring came out last year, I think. Yep, December. The editor of the uh, wildly popular Weekly Digest newsletter. I know you don't have enough of those yet. Uh, Monitoring Weekly, go get that one. And then in his day job is the founder and I think head consultant over at Aster Labs, which is a premier consulting shop for monitoring and observability with some customers you may have heard of, like uh, I think DocuSign, right? Yep, DocuSign. Great. So yes, it's probably going to come as no surprise today that we're going to be talking a lot about a subject that is also near and dear to my heart, but uh, modern observability uh, and how that intersects in, you know, modern SaaS teams and uh, in the cloud. I guess the first thing, even just get started, just table set, because there may not be uh, a lot of the listeners may not be quite as as deep on like the inside baseball. But I, I often like to ask people, given how much has shifted in the in the broader industry in the last ten years with you know, cloud computing and cloud native, how do you feel specifically in modern observability? What do you think is like the biggest kind of trend lines over the last decade in, in that space? The thing that I've noticed really, like the biggest change, has been the rise of cloud native, which means that we all started off many, many, many years ago using Nagios and Big Brother and all these old school tools. And monitoring was really like we have the monitoring server and it hits other servers and other static servers and nothing changes in your world. So you could have a task sitting on your monitor of like, go add monitoring to the server. And like, that was fine. Uh, it sucked, but it was okay. But now, like, you just go edit this manual configuration and like, it's okay because you don't do it, but like, once a week at most. And now the entire infrastructure rolls over inside of an hour. So it's like you can't think about the world that way anymore. And of course, now we have not just a load balancer with a couple servers, but like a load balancer with ASGs behind it. So the entire world is changing constantly. And answering the question, how many servers do I have, is a non-trivial question at times. Right, or how many how many containers do I have? Right, how many containers is running this application? Who knows? Yeah, and so I guess this is probably something you help a lot of your customers with, right? I mean, what, what yeah. type of people do you typically work with? What What's like the general kind of arrangement you see companies working and solving this problem in? Like how they organize, who, who do you interact with? Most of the companies I work with are the fairly large companies. A lot of them no one's ever really heard of. But they're pretty much all larger, older companies. So like a quote-unquote legacy enterprise right, versus like, a hipster enterprise. <laughs> right, yeah. Definitely legacy enterprise, like biggie enterprise sort of stuff. And they will often try to be getting into the modern era by having monitoring teams or observability teams. And most of those teams really focused on building tools and not necessarily teaching the engineering teams how to use them. So... They're buying the tools, they're trying to build monitoring, but because they didn't grow up with it like a lot of the hipster startups, they don't really quite get it yet. So then this is part then, I guess, of their broader move into the cloud, is it like part of their digital transformation, right? right. It's probably the, the word they're kicking around. And yep. <laughs> as part of that, they've now got some new monitoring and observability initiative, Yep. trying to catch up with the rest of the teams. So then going back, I mean, and uh, I'm, I'm cheating here a little bit. Listeners may know that I, I founded a monitoring company back in the day <laughs> before moving into venture. But, you know, one thing that's fascinated me over that time period, and, and maybe you have some thoughts, is as people try to solve this problem, really moving from Nagios, right? So there was, I think, probably the first kind of big, big thing to hit, at least from my perspective, was graphite. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like, like graphite completely changed how everyone views everything. 
Right. And for people not aware, I mean, Graphite came out of Orbitz, I think, yep. in 2009 and was the first open source, really pliable tool that you could adapt to a whole bunch of different ephemeral situations because you could just push data from any kind of source into it. And then you could, uh, you know, serve as like a single source of monitoring truth for the rest of the org. Yeah. So how I've been explaining it to people is... Graphite was a complete game changer, and looking back on it, I don't think people realize exactly how big of a deal it was. Because prior to that, we had tools like Nagios, but the only thing they did was they would check a system for data, get back some value, and decide, is this a good value or a bad value? And then after that, just throw the data away. Yeah, there was, I guess that's a good point. There's no historical context. There's just... right what's on fire right now and, and nothing around uh, how did it get in this state. Exactly. So with Graphite, the model changed so we were no longer checking the system for is this a good thing or a bad thing. We're just saying we make no judgment about this. We're just collecting data and then we're going to look at the data to decide is this a good thing or a bad thing. And that gave us huge amounts of flexibility and more capability in deciding how our systems are behaving because we could look back at what's historical trends. We could apply statistical analysis to it where we couldn't before. So graphite now is kind of like, it feels really old school, and there's not a ton of people really using it anymore. It's not really like a greenfield kind of tool anymore, right? Right, like if you're going to like, let's go overhaul monitoring, no one's saying let's install graphite. But it was a total game changer, and all the tools we use now grew out of graphite. Right, definitely owe some uh, some... I guess motivating factor to to it and the, the ground it kind of broke. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So, I mean, you're probably familiar, like you mentioned, it's not maybe not as much of a, a greenfield use anymore, but it's been supplanted by something that I think is at least in the modern observability space, it had a dramatic impact in the last two years, maybe. I mean, Prometheus. Have yeah. You, yeah. Are you seeing this a lot? Yeah. Here? <laughs> like the adoption of Prometheus has been wild. Like it's just it feels like it came out of nowhere. Right. And to me, like, I'm still not really sure why. It's a cool tool, but it still feels like there's a lot of challenges around it. But just the adoption of it is crazy. Can you describe just briefly, like, some listeners what it is and how it works? Yeah, so Prometheus is a... Um, <laughs> uh, I'm trying not to get into too much inside baseball here, but there's, there's the argument of push versus pull when it comes to monitoring. Right. And Prometheus is solidly on the polling model. Uh, right, you have right. to hit your servers to get this data. Well, I mean, it was specifically inspired by the infrastructure of Google, right? Uh, yeah, it, it's essentially a open source version of Google's monitoring system, Borg. And in fact, you often see Googlers, when they give presentations talking about monitoring at Google, they're using Prometheus to do the demos. Right, right, and because like, they feel like it most closely emulates the tools that they're using. Right. And it always strikes me that maybe modeling our st- architectures after uh, massive behemoths is probably not the best way to do things. Yeah, yeah, it is an interesting conundrum. I mean, when, when I'm looking at new startups, there's always this notion of, especially in infrastructure uh, and dev tools where, you know, you see a very smart team come out of a very large organization and say, hey, we've built these tools. Yep just like we had inside this very like planet web scale org, like Facebook, Google, Apple, Net, you know, Fang. And that's either, usually it's, it's very binary. It's either a very, very good thing or a very bad thing. Yep. Because it either is a smart problem that works for everybody or they're solving a problem that only exists in five companies. <laughs> right. It does seem from a, at least adoption uh, rate, though, that uh, Prometheus, it must be landing on the former. Um, yeah, ab- absolutely. It struck a nerve, it seems, in the it, industry. It has absolutely struck a nerve. I'm seeing a lot of companies that are, when they look to start their monitoring journey and, and overhaul how they're doing things, they're almost leapfrogging the previous steps that I would expect them to do and going right to Prometheus. So what, what are those steps you would normally expect? So normally I would, I would expect someone to, like, let's implement a time series database. And like we'll take the Nagios setup that we currently have and just start writing the data to disk and the change how they're thinking about it, but making incremental steps. And instead of what I'm seeing is that people are actually saying, no, let's rip everything out and put Prometheus in. In some ways, it's almost a rash decision. Like people are looking at it as, oh, the new shiny. And it's cool. Engineers love a good replatform. Man, they do. <laughs> <laughs> the power of resume-driven development cannot be overstated. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So, I mean, there's there's certainly some of that. But it, I don't want to say that Prometheus is bad, because it's not. It is actually very, very good. And the major adoption I've been seeing is coming from the more modern infrastructure companies running things like Kubernetes, 
which links up with Prometheus's model quite well. Yeah, and um, Prometheus is a cloud native computing it is. foundation yep. project. It's yeah, in the so. C- CNCF as well. Yeah, so I think that's probably definitely there are many factors going into it. I'm I'm sure that's part of it. You know, yeah. it's, it's hooked up to the Kubernetes and Envoy and some other high flyers there. Yep. So one thing, yeah, I, I thought was interesting. I want to get your take on, but you know, from the the pull based model, and what that means is that application endpoints that want to be monitored by Prometheus in its normal configuration expose an endpoint that can be queried, mm-hmm. right, and will return whenever it's queried the current state of the system. And so then Prometheus will, in some loop at some period, execute those queries, get the latest data, and that's what constitutes your history. What I think is kind of fascinating about that is now you're starting to see in projects like Kubernetes and Envoy and other things, and much more broadly, is everybody's starting to support Prometheus endpoints. Yep. What do you think about that? I mean, that that introduces some interesting possibilities, it, right? It does. I'm seeing other monitoring tools supporting Prometheus endpoints, right. which is fascinating. But it's, it's really cool. So I think that integrations with monitoring tools is really what makes or breaks a company. When I look at companies like Datadog, and when I ask the question, can they integrate with X, the answer is pretty much yes. Right, right. They have a massive list. Right, right? it's a massive list. It continues to grow constantly. And I never really have to go to a VP and say, well, no, they don't support that yet, because no, they do, which makes it just such an easy sell. So when I look at all these tools, taking the Prometheus language and saying, like, here's a Prometheus endpoint, what I see is them making it really easy sell for me to put any tool anywhere. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting that if you look at you know the kind of major players in the industry today, Datadog or, or New Relic, they've all had to build out these integrations painstakingly right. with large teams of people. Like there's a massive yep. investment that historically had to be made as a vendor Whereas, I mean, it's still early days, but if if the trend continues and and a Prometheus endpoint becomes standard in any kind of popular piece of infrastructure software, Mm -hmm. let alone if people start building those into their custom microservices, right, then suddenly it in some ways levels the playing field for new vendors, which is great. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. That massive investment that you have to do up front of like, let's build tons and tons of integrations is it's almost too much of an investment. It can kill the company before you even get off the ground. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, speaking as having built one, <laughs> there's always this constant balance of trying to build features in the product yep. like that drove real value, and then building the glue that got the data from all the places you needed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with Prometheus Endpoint, it's almost democratizing the integrations. So yeah. it definitely lowers the barrier to entry for new vendors, which yeah. is great. And that leads to, I'd like to segue in another interesting parallel and I think another kind of emerging trend in the industry in about the same time period, the last two years, is tracing. <laughs> yeah. I assume you've been talking with some of your customers about that. But I mean, specifically in tracing, there's a similar effort, uh, open tracing, mm-hmm. uh, which is being driven in part by Lightstep, you know, which is a fantastic heavy bit company. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing are you seeing tracing? No, like <laughs> <laughs> tracing is being talked about, but not by any of my customers. Fair. Um, the, it definitely seems more uh, just to continue. I, it seems more hipster enterprise right it, now. It really does. It's one of those things that you see it at every meetup you go to. You see it at every conference you go to, and it's always by like the big Bay Area darling companies. And right, Lyft, Uber, right, et cetera. Ly- Lyft, Uber, uh, Pinterest has one. Uh, so Twitter. You, yeah, so you have all these distributed tracing frameworks or like implementations, and they're interesting. They make for a killer demo, but for most people, it's not actually that useful yet. Yeah, well, and I guess we should probably, in terms of context, by distributed tracing is popularized by Google almost eight years ago now with the, the Dapper paper yeah. was published. But this notion that if you have a distributed system, uh, you know, and we now call you know microservices with some type of fan out architecture where requests comes in and sub components get farmed out to other microservices um, that you have some unique context that follows the the serial requests out yep so then when the request is finished you can draw like like basically a map literally of how the requests like fanned out into your infrastructure and how long it's spent at each particular spot yeah so it's perhaps to put it more Concisely, it's the idea of being able to trace a single request through your entire system. As it propagates through the system. Yeah, as it propagates through the entire system. And one really cool use I've seen of it is for really complex distributed architectures, 
being able to map out what services are talking to what others. Right, actually literally just even knowing what the yeah, map like is. Yeah, like just knowing what your map is is actually pretty hard when you're running distributed yeah. systems. I think it was at um, Monorama two years ago. I think it was Uber where there was a talk on distributed tracing and the very first thing the engineer said was, Nobody Uber actually knows what all the services <laughs> is or like literally the only way yeah. they can know what's happening in the system is from a trace. Yeah, Netflix has a tool called Visceral that they use. And one of the cool things about it is you end up with this massive map. Like at the time they had something like 950 microservices in their systems. And it's just as complex as Uber. Like how do you know what services are being used for what, and how do you know what the level of traffic is? Yeah, I mean, there's I guess, there's effectively like a Dunbar's number for microservices, <laughs> right? right? Like, like any yeah. one person can only track so many microservices in their head at any one time. Right. So yeah, it, it is interesting. I, I do think you're right. It, I, I do think it's very early, and I do think there's probably, I don't know what the number is or if anyone's done any actually like kind of quantitative analyses, but I suspect there's like a number of microservices you need to have interacting, and I don't know if it's 10 or 20 or 30. You know, I, I suspect it's probably like, let's say eight or more, mm -hmm. where you actually really start to need it, or you maybe yeah, don't realize I, it yet. I would argue it's probably a lot more than that. So I know companies that have tracing and hesitantly admit that it's not actually that useful for them. And I wonder just how much it has to do with knowledge level of the engineers, uh, complexity of their environment, and in that sense it'd be like a simpler environment would probably have less need of this than a more complex one. All right, how much do you think it is um, the complexity of the tools? Because at least until very recently... And honestly, I, I would say even literally in probably the last year, if, if you looked at the tooling that was available outside of effectively Google, you know, uh, uh, Twitter had open sourced the Zipkin project some years ago. But I think in many ways, it's kind of a spiritual twin to Graphite where it, it added this fundamental capability, but one that wasn't maybe super approachable. And I think it's really only between, I'd say, Lightstep and then as far as I'm aware, you know, Datadog has introduced a tracing capability and then uh, App Optics, which is from my former company, mm -hmm. uh, introduced just some number of months ago. And and outside of those, you know, trying to make it approachable, it, it is a very complex thing for an engineer to wrap their head around if they're not already steeped in the yeah, agreed. space. So I, I think a lot of it has to do with, and it's the pattern where in most orgs you see a handful of people who can kind of grok and understand what it's doing in the tools. And I, I just think there's a lot of work the tools have to do to make it more. It's a very complex topic. Yeah, it uh, absolutely agreed. It's a complex topic, and I don't think the tools are doing a very good job of making the users better. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. So, but part of that, what is interesting is there's, I guess there's there's two efforts. I mean, we, I mentioned open tracing, but uh, one thing that's definitely happening there, and that uh, this is this effort to make, I guess, the wire format, right, or yeah. uh, of, of a trace context. Because, again, historically, a big problem with these is they were generated, the, the actual context, the way you did it, was install a client side SDK in every single application in your infrastructure yep. that, you know, uh, not monkey, pa I guess in dynamic language is probably monkey patched, but uh, actually like augmented every incoming and outgoing request response transparently yeah. to the user code. Which, you know, when you're at an organization like Google, you can say, hey, if you want your code to go into prod, you will <laughs> add this RPC library. <laughs> right. But as like an open source, or if you're just one engineer inside a large company, or if you're a much smaller time vendor trying to sell your solution, getting someone to agree to whole hog in a polyglot now, especially in, in 2018, where almost every interesting org is polyglot. They have three, yep. four, five languages, no ops. And so, yeah, I think open tracing is this kind of effort to, yeah, try to overcome that. How, how do you see that working? Uh, I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a good thing that people are trying to standardize on this now. For the longest time, it was several competing standards you had different factions trying to compete with it. So now that we have open tracing and everyone's saying, hey, like, why don't we just use that one thing? Like, that's great. Yeah, um, it does seem, and we're talking particularly maybe at the service mesh layer, they're starting to have a lot of success in standardizing or making that available. Mm -hmm. So if you are using uh, you know, Envoy or Nginx or something like that, you'll be able to plug that into your yeah. open tracing compatible tools. Are you familiar with the uh, Open Census project? No, I'm not. Oh yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Well, I, I won't spend too much time bloviating about it, but I would like to get maybe get your fresh take on it. So that's an effort being driven by Google, but I think most recently joined by Microsoft to standardize a set of 
uh, client side libraries for APM and trace data. So not just, you know, like a wire format, but literally if you drop this library into your application, it will actually create the trace. It will collect some APM data and then push that out in a consumable form. So it's in a, in a sense kind of going back, like trying to standardize or completely remove the investment normally required where you need to build out instrumentation for every language you want your tool to support. I love it. Um, I, I would worry about how the how the incumbent vendors are going to handle it, um, given that you know they have an investment in not accepting it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, I think, in terms of whether that is supported as a subset of what they do or right. if it's, uh, you know, I think it's something that'll be ripe for the old embrace and extend ploy. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I've been seeing is people taking the age-old StatsD protocol and building a fully compliant agent around that spec, but then extending it some. And it, yeah, embrace and extend is an age-old method that Stats works D. really well. Yeah, man, that's the, uh, there's a throwback. Never has <laughs> never has 300 lines of JavaScript ever been so abused in so many ways. Yeah, Stats, uh, interesting was, uh, actually, we should have mentioned that earlier. I mean, uh, paired with Graphite, I think Stats, the, uh, I mean, yeah, the, that really kicked off everything with Etsy's blog posts and the announcement of it back in, God, like 2011. Yeah, monitor everything. Yeah, and they're at their Church of Graphs. Yes, yep. yeah, yeah. You know, we've talked about, you know, a couple hot trends, so tracing and Prometheus. There's, there's at least one other I want to touch on, machine learning. <laughs> to, to put it simply, I think it's mostly bullshit. Most, mostly. M- mostly bullshit. Mostly. Uh, there's a qualifier there. I, yeah, there's a qualifier there. I will say in monitoring, it's pretty much all bullshit, but I'm sure it's useful in other non-monitoring contexts. Interesting. So I think in your job, when you're working with your clients, you probably, I assume, do a lot of sourcing and evaluation. Yeah. Are you seeing a lot of vendors talking about this, machine I, learning? I see a lot of vendors talking about it, but there's a huge disconnect between what the vendors want to sell me, like the, the promise they're selling of machine learning is going to make everything better, and what my clients actually need, which is I need better monitoring. Right, right, which... And, which there's probably some subtle but important differences between right. those two. Yeah, absolutely. Machine learning is... It's a neat engineering idea, but well, it, it really seems that people are building these machine learning products around the basis of, I want to do machine learning, and not around the basis of, I want to solve a problem. It does seem something, if we're zooming out into like just the broader industry, I mean, it's something that I think over the last five or six years has shown in certain verticals really big successes. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's been any real, like really horizontal platform wins, and right. I think that speaks to at least... Current state of the art that you know the different models and techniques really need to be tailored to the specific vertical. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with that. No, nobody's like solved some unified theory of, <laughs> of machine learning yet. Yeah. Um, so then, taking it back then to the monitoring specific vertical, what would you say is the most successful application you've seen of it? I would say probably alert aggregation. And, okay. So like uh, and, clustering. Yeah. So like, um, I can't remember the vendor that really first popularized this, but there's been a few others that have followed. But the concept is that I have alerts flowing in from several different monitoring tools, and if something goes wrong, I probably have multiple alerts talking about the same thing. Yeah, so there was like, I think like Big Panda, yeah. uh, Moogsoft, I think. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so you end up with all these different alerts coming in, and you can rub a little machine learning on it and start to pick up on what is actually happening, where is the problem likely located, and you eventually develop a model for it, which is cool. But after a while, I, I I have to wonder, if you consistently have these same sorts of problems and machine learning is telling you, hey, the problem's over there, why don't you just go fix that? Right, yeah. I, I guess the other places, I've seen it applied in two, two other places to, I think, two different degrees of success. And love to so one is... Um, like log analysis. Oh, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of, uh, and I think even Elastic has some basic capabilities yep. built into the open source product. There's a whole slew of vendors who all have their own take on clustering log events. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems like it would lend itself to be reasonable, have some reasonable success there. You know, the other one that I think maybe has been a lot less effective and, and way more noise and <laughs> signal, no pun intended, is anomaly detection yeah. in, in telemetry. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. 
anomaly detection is like the big promise that we've all been told for you know 30 years yeah Except, literally a holtz winter paper at yeah, newsnix was 20 you know 20 plus years yeah, ago like, seriously and we still don't have it and it's because it's a hard problem it's a yeah, really hard problem yeah it's a really hard problem there are some situations where we can solve the really simple versions of it but it's not really anomaly detection at that point right yeah i, I think what's interesting and this is probably a, a good segue but what was always interesting to me is anomaly detection for some signal, and there are some, some telemetry where I, I really don't know the shape of it or it's like super seasonal. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there are other things. So like if I'm thinking about my um, you know, key performance indicators of a service like latency, you know, I don't need a neural net to know <laughs> that like three second response times are bad, are right. never good. Yeah. And I would like to get your take on this. At least when I was selling to customers, that was the problem that most of them weren't even coming close to solving yet, was not like very sophisticated scenarios. It was literally just like, is the service ridiculous? Like, are my users in complete agony or not? Yeah, (laughs) absolutely agreed. Yeah, you don't need to do really complex stuff. So I had someone ask me recently about static thresholds on disk space. And like, I know static thresholds are bad and I I shouldn't, but when it comes to disk space, like I shouldn't have a static threshold. And I'm like, well, what are you doing instead? Well, I don't have an alert on disk space. Because it would be static and static Right, because it would be static and static is bad. And I'm like, well, why don't you just try, I don't know, setting a static alert of like 10% free is a bad thing and see where you go from there. If you're not doing the basic stuff, the foundational work, then there's no way you can possibly work with the more advanced stuff either. Nothing complex starts out complex. You evolve yeah. over time. Crawl, crawl, walk, run. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And when it comes to alerting, people are trying to do really complex stuff right out of the gate because they know the foundational stuff is old and it's bad and like all this stuff, but that's not really true. We still have problems. And by the way, the stuff we've been doing for 20 years actually kind of works. It's maybe not the best, but if you're not doing anything, then go with stuff that's like half as good. It'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, so your bread and butter is coming into an organization that knows fundamentally they need to get better at, mm-hmm. at monitoring and observability. And um, which I think you can call out. Uh, uh, so, so Google is the Google SRE book, by the way, has a bunch of really, I think, good information on this topic. Yeah, but it, totally. One of the like single <laughs> key takeaways that I really liked is a pyramid of uh, reliability. Oh yeah, right? uh, Dickerson's hierarchy of yeah, hierarchy. reliability. Yes, yeah, yeah, modeled after the hierarchy of a uh, hierarchy of needs, right? Yep. Um, but for service reliability, and the very lowest level of that is monitoring. Yeah, like the single first thing you need is monitoring. And it goes back, you, know, you can't manage what you can't measure, right? right. If you like, think about like the Drucker quote. So when you come into an organization, I mean, it's to, it's to help them kind of, in, fundamentally, it's to help increase service reliability and the, and the speed at which they can move. Right. So what is the kind of state you typically find things in when you come in? Man, it's, it's all over the place. So some companies I'll come in, they have absolutely no monitoring of any kind. And they're monitoring as well. Someone comes and yells at us when it's not working. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like monitored by the customer, kind of. Yeah, like monitored by the customer. Uh, our alerting is Twitter, so Where we have a big TV on the wall with a live Twitter search. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, let's just pay attention to how many inbound calls we get that the site's down. And in those situations, I'm like, cool. So let's just go install Pingdom and monitor the website, and like, that's it. Right. Let's, step one. Yeah. Step one is: is the site up? And then we can get more complex from there. You can't get to like Netflix level monitoring right out of the gate. It took them years and years to do that and millions of dollars in investment. So when I come into a company, I I have to set those expectations. This is going to take a while. And the state of your monitoring is somewhere between non-existent and pretty bad. Yeah, and actively harmful. Right, like actively harmful. Uh, You have bad information. It's better to have no information at this point. So I always start with the simple things of, is the application working? What's the throughput on the application, like the number of requests coming through, the errors, and how long is all this stuff taking? Like, what's the latency? Yeah. And we just start there. So do you just help them get some key service level indicators Yeah, basically. Set up? So we, we just start out of, what matters to you? What does this application do? And why does it matter? And then from there, we can develop KPIs that we care about and then start tying those to technical metrics. It is very simple stuff. I don't immediately install a dozen alerts. It's more like one or two, and they're very high-level stuff. Yeah, and then uh, I guess typically do you see, and again, to me, you know, having come and, and built a company in the space and kind of watched it evolve over the last 
10 years. What are you seeing now in terms of build versus buy on these systems? I mean, I think 10 years ago, for a lot of people, build was the only choice. Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting. I always thought that large enterprises were going to bring stuff in-house for compliance and security reasons. But what I'm finding is that that's not actually true anymore. A lot of them are saying, no, no, we don't want to run this. We don't have that expertise. We want to pay someone. We want to buy SaaS tools and rely on those. So I think that buy versus build pendulum has definitely swung in the other direction. Right. And a lot of people are outsourcing to SaaS companies, which is awesome. Like, it's hideously expensive to run this stuff yourself, and you're probably not an expert at it. So Definitely not an expert yeah, at it. <laughs> definitely not an expert at it. So you should absolutely pay someone else to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think certainly the way this space has evolved, and you know, particularly in the last few years, IT always moves in cycles. Yep. And there's, um, there's this period of creative disruption, which kind of like a whole bunch of new capabilities that incumbents don't have kind of emerge in, in different players. And then you go through like a convergence cycle where the dominant players who kind of emerge in the early side start to roll up all the capabilities they need. And it definitely seems yeah. like in, in monitoring, we're, I think, pretty clearly in a convergent cycle at yeah, this point. It's, <laughs> it's, it's wild seeing all these companies start buying up other companies. And it's not like a logging company buys another logging company. It's, right. it's like logging company buys an APM company and a server monitoring company and a tracing company and now has a full stack of we're a one-stop shop for all things monitoring. Yeah, I mean, there's a... You know, New Relic with the Offsmatic acquisition a couple of years yep. ago of creating New Relic infrastructure. Uh, Datadog, I think, acquired Logmatic, building out APM. Uh, historically, is you know massive infrastructure monitoring provider. Yep. Historically, I mean, Elastic bought. Uh, Probably like three or four companies. Yeah, yeah. And, I was gonna say Elastic, who's now just announced their IPO. Uh, yeah. I mean, they are, they're definitely positioning themselves in the same place. They bought uh, APM company. They bought a a, a machine learning company. Yep. who acquired Prelert two years ago to work on logs. So, and then uh, uh, SolarWinds, who acquired my company, has uh, driven five or six acquisitions in the cloud native <laughs> space. Yeah. <laughs> SolarWinds didn't just buy your company; they bought like half the companies. <laughs> half the companies in space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and then you got you know CA is picking up companies like Runscope yep. and yeah so I mean it's just the clear convergence which I mean going back to your point I think as an enterprise buyer uh, or even SME you know having a smaller number of vendors who have all of the pieces of the puzzle and you know it, they each have their own strengths and some of their pieces may not be as good as someone else's version of that but really I, I think for the, the typical enterprise buyer being able to just go to one vendor and saying hey we're just going to Get the stuff from them, and it's it's good enough. Right? Yeah, absolutely. If there's only one vendor I need to work with, then that makes it a much easier sell. But at that same time, if if one of the vendor's pieces of product isn't up to par, then it's not really a problem to not use that and go buy something completely unrelated. Sure, if they, if that is a critical need for you, right? So, like, say just to use an example out of my head is Datadog. Like, Datadog has a fantastic infrastructure product. What if their logging support isn't what the client needs? Well, we don't have to use logging. We go buy that from Sumo Logic or right. Elastic or whoever else. Or if somebody doesn't meet one part of their product, doesn't meet the uh, like security compliances or exactly. something. Exactly. Yeah, well, at that point, it's just a trade off on yeah. budgets and complexity, right? Yeah. yeah. A big concern that I hear from clients is they just have too many tools. So, yes, yeah. The consolidation on the monitoring companies kind of hides that complexity. Like if I'm buying Datadog, well, Datadog is really like three or four different products at this point. But as an enterprise buyer, I don't think about it that way anymore because Datadog is just one product. Like I only have one tool. But that's not actually true. I have like four tools still. Yeah. It's just one check. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly from a procurement perspective, that helps. Yeah. Uh, you can only have to drive like one vendor through procurement, which if... Uh... Well, even inside of engineering perception, Having that one vendor kind of hides that it's just that it's not multiple tools. It yeah. it really is, but the perception is that it's not. Which leads, you know, w- with all that happening, what do you think are still the biggest kind of open opportunities, or they're either open opportunities or renewed opportunities in the space right now that aren't really being filled? Something I've been harping about for years, and this is due to my professional background, is network monitoring, and I'm not talking like. 
servers on a network. I'm talking actual physical in data centers in corporate office so networks. So like switches. Yeah, like and... switches, routers, network taps, like this actual hardware. Right. So there's only a few companies that do this even moderately well, and they're all very old incumbents. They're very slow to move, have really long buying cycles, and everyone kind of doesn't like the products, and they have really annoying salespeople. So... There are a few companies that have tried to go after them, but then got seduced away by the, we want to build cloud native stuff. And I'm like, no, no, there's a huge opportunity in network monitoring, but no one's really going after it. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's like that class of like boring problems, right? Where yeah, <laughs> bo- boring problems, but holy crap, the amount of money to be made. Yeah, yeah, boring, but theoretically probably wildly. If you look at Stripe, right? Like I, before man. Stripe, billing was a boring problem. So I've got a friend that works for the University of Florida, and he works for the entire system. He's a network engineer and procures tools and hardware on a regular basis. So I ask him, what do you spend every year on maintenance and software and tools and all that? And he's like, well, it's a minimum of $12 million a year. $12 million a year. Right, a minimum of $12 million a year. And he's like, when I buy licensing for my monitoring tools, like they're highly specialized, and yeah, we'll drop one hundred fifty, two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year on maintenance. And I'm like, that's pretty good money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. I think you're right. It's and it's an interesting challenge because um, a lot of times monitoring companies seem to be founded or created by engineers who are working on some you know line of business application, right? Scaling in some strange way and couldn't find the tooling they needed. Yep. And in most cloud native, where most new applications are being created, network monitoring really isn't a concern. Because no, it's just the, not a thing. It's not a thing at all because you never see switches or, or <laughs> right. routers. Yeah, we just trust that Amazon has our back and we move on with our day. Right. I, th- I think you're right. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that next company comes out of. Yeah, I, I don't think the hardware is going away. It, there's still computers somewhere. There's still data centers somewhere. When you have companies like... DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean runs their own data centers. What are they doing for monitoring? How are they monitoring their physical infrastructure? It's still a problem. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point, obviously. Uh, e- even the companies with large corporate offices, they still have connectivity inside. What are they doing to monitor it? Right. Swinging the pendulum way to the other side of the timeline, <laughs> one thing I want to get your opinion on, something I've been looking at a lot, is serverless monitoring. Oh, yeah. And boy, you did go to the other side. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go from the data center to serverless and just kind of skip everything in between. What do, what do you think? Uh, I, don't know if any are, I don't know if any of your customers are doing serverless yet or lambdas. Not, or... None of my customers are. It's still very much an engineering toy. But there is still a very open-ended question of how do we monitor this. For that matter, there's still the open-ended question of how do we deploy it. Right, how do we build applications <laughs> yeah, out like, of it. Yeah, yeah. Like there, I think that serverless is where Docker was a few years ago in that it's really cool and uh, works in my machine is about the extent of it. Uh, So it's great for prototyping, but then once you try to run an actual infrastructure on it, there's a lot of questions that we haven't solved yet. And one of those biggest ones is monitoring. How do we monitor this? And there's some vendors that are starting to do some pretty cool work around it, but it's still very much young. We don't really understand what are the failure modes of it, what does scaling look like? What kind of information should we get out of it? What are the best practices around serverless monitoring? So it's still very much an in-development area. Yeah, it's kind of like you said, there are there's certainly, I think there's probably like four, at least four or five vendors now all independently yeah. building serverless monitoring. And to me, you know, there's a couple of axes that I think are interesting. One is how many serverless-only infrastructures will there, will there be? Yep. I guess, and part of that uh, is how complex, you know, is this going to continue to be kind of outsourced batch pieces or will you literally be building like a complex, effectively, you know, 10,000 function application that needs to be traced end to end? Yeah. There was someone that made a comment at Monitorama some years ago. I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, former Netflix CTO. Oh, okay. Yeah. A- Adrian Cockcroft. Adrian. Adrian. So yeah. Adrian Cockcroft made a comment. When you have serverless functions, They take microseconds to run. So if you have your entire infrastructure is microservices and it completely turns over every few seconds, then how do you know what last minute looked like? Uh, So how do you get this information? How do you understand the state of your world when it doesn't exist anymore? Right, right. It's completely changed. Right, like you can't pull these things. Like it's far too fast, so you have to emit the data out, but... 
keeping a state of the world is actually kind of important. Knowing what your world looked like, like how many Lambda functions did I run in the last minute? Uh, during this one minute period, how many were currently running, serving how many requests that did what? And that's kind of a hard question to answer. Yeah, and I, I think the other interesting question is, how driven or motivated will the providers themselves, so Amazon, Google, Microsoft, be given that serverless specifically is so embedded into the platform? Like yeah, far more than any any computing paradigm that's preceded it. I mean, even containers you can run on EC2 instances. Right. You know, will they be driven to provide like much higher fidelity monitoring and, and observability capabilities earlier than they have historically done those kind of things? I sure hope so. Yeah, but, uh, agreed. <laughs> but I, I'm not holding my breath on that one. Right, right, yeah. All right. Well, hey, I think we've uh, we've come to about time here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been great. I love love to talk shop on monitoring, and we'll uh, we'll definitely have to have you back sometime. Sounds great. Thanks for listening to this episode of High Leverage. If you'd like to suggest a guest or topic, let us know on Twitter at HeavyBit. To learn more about HeavyBit, visit HeavyBit.com to check out our library. It's an amazing resource for insights on developer sales, marketing, product, and general management from leaders in our community.